The other thing I want to just announce again, because I know some of you don't have email, is that our consecration date is still the Feast of the Visitation. I'm not changing our consecration date, but our get-together, our celebration of that is going to be May the 30th instead of May the 31st. So on the schedule that I sent out at the beginning of the year is incorrect. So I ran into some lady yesterday, and she's like, 8 o'clock on the 31st, right? And I was like, oh, gosh. So there's still people who don't know this. So please spread the word, especially if you know people who did it last year, because a lot of times people from previous years join us, which is wonderful. We usually have a really big group. Um, so May 30th. 11.30 Mass, you do not have to come to that. I still plan to read my consecration prayer again on the 31st at Mass by myself because I love that feast. I love the gospel that day. It's the Magnificat. Um, but just it's nice to do it as a group. We are going to do the scapular enrollment again this year. Um, I had a man yesterday offer to donate scapulars. So I wasn't sure about that because we ran out last year and then I felt bad. So he's going to... Um, purchase scapulars for everyone, and we're going to do a scapular enrollment right after our consecration. Father's going to bless us and lead us in the consecration. So that's May 30th, 1130 Mass, right after Mass, okay? Um, I think that's it. Anyway, I'll keep reminding you, and I also, we, we start our consecration prayers this weekend. Um, I will be talking about it at the next couple of meetings as we go along. So... It's kind of overwhelming right now. We are going to talk about the whole thing today really quickly. He talks about it in this section, which is why we skipped a section. But I'll go into, you know, give you tips along the way through, through the month of May. So let's go ahead and start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh my God, firmly believe that you are one God and three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because you have revealed them, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Amen. August, Queen of Heaven, Sovereign Mistress of the Angels, who did receive from the beginning the mission and the power to crush the serpent's head, we beseech thee to send thy holy angels that under thy command and by thy power they may pursue the evil spirits, encounter them on every side, resist their bold attacks, and drive them hence into the abyss of woe. Holy Mother, send thy holy angels to defend us and to drive the cruel enemy from us. Tender Mother, thou shalt ever be our love and our hope. Holy angels and archangels, keep and defend us. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Enlighten us, guide us, and increase in us all the virtues necessary to live a life totally devoted to Jesus through Mary. Still in our hearts a filial love and devote on the Mother of God. With great confidence in her maternal heart and an abiding refuge in her mercy, so that by her you may truly form in us Jesus Christ, great and mighty, unto the fullness of his perfect age. Amen. Mother of Good Counsel, Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Patroness of the Unborn, Saints Joachim and Anne, Saint Joseph, Patron of the Universal Church, Saint Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Colby, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, Blessed John Paul the Great, Father Patrick Gaffney, our patron saints and guardian angels. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I just read this morning that there's been a second miracle for John Paul II. So, there, it's, it's not 100%, but I, I've had two emails now that have said that there's this, by October, he'll be made a saint by October. So that's awesome, exciting. <clears throat> okay, we um, didn't get through the section last time, and I want to make sure we get through the section today, so that I don't like being behind. So um, we'll probably go a little bit over today since we're starting late. I apologize for that, but I had to get the books all set up, and that took a while. Um, Anyway, we, we, last time we met, we talked about the story of Jacob, Esau, and Rebekah. 
Um, in Article 1, he focused on Esau being a figure of a reprobate, a person that was living their life apart from God, basically, relying on themselves, not spending time in prayer, um, not depending on God, um, no devotion to the Blessed Mother, at least very little. And then he also talked about Jacob being a figure of a predestinate soul, which is a person that is living in the state of grace. Um, and you can go back and review what we... Uh, the notes on predestination is kind of a complex issue, but basically God sees ahead of time what our choices are going to be. He wants, he wants everyone to be saved, of course. Um, okay, so then the article two, he focused on Mary as, or Rebecca as being a figure of the Blessed Mother. And so that's a very beautiful section, and that's what we're going to finish up today. And what he says is that the Blessed Mother helps her children in a very special way, especially those children who are totally consecrated to her now. Obviously, she helps all her children, but through this devotion, through this consecration that we're getting ready to make, she helps us in a, in a more, really. And so he gives five ways that she helps us, okay? We got through the first way. The first way is that she loves us, obviously, as a mother. And he gives us five ways that she loves us. So there's five ways in just this first one. So let me just review those really quick. The first one was that she's always on the lookout to do us good. And how wonderful and beautiful that is to know that. She takes care of our interests. Even the most minute little detail, you can go to her for every little thing. And she, she anticipates what you need. As a matter of fact, I had a Mary call happen yesterday. Oh, this is my new term, thanks to this woman right here in the front row. Um, well, that's what I call it now because that's what it is. But anyway, yesterday, I just have to share this because this is talk about my new detail and talk about her anticipating your needs. Yesterday morning when I went to pick up the books for consecration, the 33 days to morning glory wasn't in yet. I had called the Catholic shop in the morning about 10 o'clock and they weren't in. So about 5 till 12, I packed up my car and I was on my way to do the lesson yesterday. And I said, oh, and my car, my, my cell phone was already packed in my, in my car. I'd ran back in the house. And I said, oh, bless my mother, can, we, can you just have those books arrive? Just, it would just be helpful if you could just have those. And no sooner did I get in my car and there was a message on my cell phone. And it was the exact moment that I had said that prayer. And it was the Catholic shop saying, they just arrived. So that's how much she loves us. Okay, the second thing, she gives us advice. We have the Feast of Our Lady of Good Counsel coming up on Friday this week. And I, I just love her under that title of Our, Our Lady, Mother of Good Counsel. She gives us good advice through, as we learned, the ministry of, our, of the angels, our guardian angel in particular is how she speaks to us. Um, number three, she receives the offering that we give her of ourself, of our body and soul in particular. And she receives that from us and then strips, helps us to strip ourselves of our self-love and our sinfulness. And then the fourth thing is she clothes us with her virtues and her merits. And this is something that is such a gift and that I actually uh, visibly see when I you know, think about it, especially at Mass, going up to communion, that I'm clothed with her. And it's just such a comforting image that I, I take with me. Um, and as we saw, that at our... Those devoted to Mary will have a double clothing then at their death. They'll have their clothing, their baptismal robe, as long as we're in the state of grace. But we'll also have that clothing of Mary's mantle, which is such a beautiful image. And then, so those are the four things. And so then now we're on the fifth thing. And that's paragraph 207. So let's look at that. And the fifth thing then is that she obtains for us the Father's blessing. Okay, and this blessing is a three-part blessing. And I'm going to just actually refer you back to paragraph 184 really quick because um, this three-part blessing that we're getting ready to read about is described in the story of Isaac blessing Jacob. So paragraph 184, and it's the third paragraph. Because that's a long... It's the story that we read of Jacob, Esau, and Rebekah. Okay, so if you go to the third paragraph, it says... After he, Isaac, had eaten, and in kissing Jacob, he smelt the odor of his perfumed garments. He blessed him and wished for him, and this is number one, the dew of heaven and the fruitfulness of the earth. That's the first part of the blessing. Two, he made him lord over all of his brethren. And three, he finished the blessing with these words, blessed be he that curseth thee, and, blessed, and let him that blesseth thee be filled with blessings. 
Okay, that last one, I just want to read this to you. I mentioned it last time, but that's taken from Genesis 12. Oh, I don't have the, yeah. Genesis 12, um, and I'm just going to read you um, verse 1 to 3. And this is when God calls Abraham, okay? And he says, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your land, your relatives, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a, bless a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will find blessing in you. So that's where that comes from. Um, if it sounds strange, we don't often hear that wording used today, but... Um, you know, the Lord does obviously blesses us when we are good to others and we lose grace, which you could call a curse when we persecute others. So it really um, isn't as, you know, harsh as it sounds. Okay, um, so 207, let's start reading that then. And you'll see a number five there because that's the fifth part of the first thing that Mary does for us, which is she loves us. Okay, so it says... <clears throat> Finally, she enables them to obtain the blessing of our Heavenly Father. Though being but the youngest born and indeed only adopted children, they have no natural right to it. With these garments, all new, most precious, and the most frag fragrant odor, and with their body and soul well prepared and dressed, they draw near with confidence to the Father's bed of repose. He understands and distinguishes their voice, which is the voice of a sinner. He touches their hands covered with the skins. He smells the good odor of their clothes. He eats with joy of that which Mary, their mother, has dressed for him. He recognizes in them the merits and the good odor of his son and of his holy mother. And so first he gives them his double blessing, the blessing of the dew of heaven, that is to say of divine grace, which is the seed of glory. He hath blessed us with spiritual blessings in Christ. And then the blessing of the fat of the earth, that is to say the good father gives them their daily bread and a sufficient abundance of the goods of this world. Secondly, he makes them masters of their own other brethren, the reprobate. But this primacy is not always apparent in this world, which passes in an instant, and where the reprobate are often masters. How long shall sinners glory? Shall they utter and speak iniquity? I have seen the wicked highly exalted and lifted up. But it is nevertheless a true primacy, and it will appear manifestly in the other world for all eternity, where the just, as the Holy Ghost says, shall reign over the nations and command them. Thirdly, his majesty, not content with blessing them in their person and their goods, blesses also those who shall bless them and curses also those who shall curse and persecute them. So I just want to look really quick. This first blessing, he blesses us with the dew of heaven and the fruitfulness of the earth. So through the Blessed Mother, we re obtain, as she be, especially as being the mediatrix of all grace, the, um, the grace, grace, which is the divine life. But then also, and he uses interesting wording here, a sufficient abundance of the goods of the earth. So, you know, it's kind of contradictory. Really, sufficient means, you know, just enough, but an abundance of what we need, not necessarily what we want. And Jesus tells us this, seek first the kingdom and all else will be given to you. So we, by doing this devotion and by going to the Blessed Mother, we are seeking first the kingdom. And this helps us not to worry about the future and worry about tomorrow, which is, you know, Jesus tells us to, to worry about today, let tomorrow take care of itself. So that's the first part of the blessing. And then secondly, he makes us masters over our brethren. And as we know, this isn't seen in this life per se, except that we do have a prayer power over them, as I like to call it. You know, we won't necessarily see uh, the result of our prayers. Sometimes we do, but we're praying for their conversion and we're praying for them. And sometimes we see that. Um, but that is a power that we exercise over the reprobate in this life. But if you remember earlier from the year, we talked about that um, uh, the scripture verse where Jesus, the servant uh, gave the the master gave the servant talents or, or money, whatever, you know, five, ten, ten, five, and one talent, and they buried them, the last one did, but the others multiplied theirs. Anyway, um, we use that story to show that in the next life, there will, we will be given a certain responsibility, if you were here for that, um, because Jesus, or the, the master says, you've been faithful in small matters, I will give you greater responsibilities, come and share your master's joy. So this takes place at the end of their life. Okay, I'm just a quick review on that. Um, 
So we know that in heaven, and there's patron saints of this and that, you know, based on how they live their lives. And we use that story to help explain why the Blessed Mother has great responsibilities in heaven being queen because of how she lived her life down here. So um, and we're going to talk later about the rosary, but if you, and I encourage you to read the 15 promises of the rosary, but one of the 15 promises is, is that you will have greater glory in heaven. So, you know, this, we don't know exactly what that means, but it, it could be tied to you have greater responsibilities in heaven as well. So that's all a mystery right now, but um, it is, you know, the teaching that um, there's, it's a hierarchy and, you know, there, it's a city of God and that there will be uh, people that rule over others. We don't understand how that works, but someday we will. And then the third, of course, part is God is going to bless us and those who bless us and those who curse and persecute us will lose grace, which is, can be considered a curse until they repent and go to confession. Okay, so let's go on then. Number two, it says she fosters and nurtures them. The second charitable, this is about the Eucharist, uh, most especially. This is 208. The second charitable duty, which our lady which our blessed lady fulfills toward her faithful servants is that she furnishes them with everything, both for their body and for their souls. She gives them the double clothing as we have just seen. She gives them to eat of the most exquisite meats of the table of God, for she gives them to eat of the bread of life, which she herself has formed. My dear children, she says, under the name of divine wisdom, be filled with my generations, that is to say, with Jesus, the fruit of life, whom I have brought into the world for you. Come, she repeats to them in another place, eat my bread, which is Jesus, and drink the wine of his love, which I have mixed for you. And these are taken from Song of Songs, in the Book of Wisdom, Proverbs. As it is Mary who is the treasurer and the dispenser of the gifts and the graces of the Most High. She gives a good portion, and indeed the best portion, to nourish and maintain her children and servants. They are fattened on the living bread. They are inebriated with the wine which brings forth virgins. They are born at the bosom of Mary. They have such facility in carrying the yoke of Jesus Christ that they feel almost nothing of its weight. The oil of devotion has made it soften and decay, and the yoke shall putrefy in the presence of the oil. So this is actually really beautiful. It brings to mind Jesus, um, the scripture verse, at least when I read this, um, at the Eucharist where he says, come to me, you know, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You know, he says, for my burden is easy, whatever it is. I have it written down. But um, anyway, you know, it's one of my favorite verses. It's such so comforting. Um, but she's talking about the Blessed Mother it was going to bring you. I mean, there's no question, no doubt that she is going to bring you into a deeper understanding and belief in the true presence. And she is going to increase your hunger and your desire for the Eucharist. You know, eventually she wants us all at daily mass. I know because of the duties of our state, we can't all do that now. But she wants to bring you to the point where you hunger for that daily, that daily bread. Um, some of the mystics say that she baked the bread um, for the apostles at the time of Christ. It's a private revelation, um, which would make sense anyway. Um, but anyway, this whole idea of the yoke um, at the time of Jesus' time, a lot of people were farmers. And so a yoke was the wooden beam that was placed between two oxen to keep them, you know, level and together and united and so they wouldn't run off. And so that was made out of wood and it was placed on the neck and it was, you know, pretty uncomfortable, you can imagine. So this is beautiful here um, that the oil of devotion, so specifically true devotion to Mary, has made, has softened the wood. I, I just love that. I just think that is so beautiful. Um, okay, so let's go on then. Number three. It says she conducts and directs them. The third good which Our Lady does for her servants is that she conducts and directs them according to the will of her divine son. Rebecca guided her little Jacob and gave him good advice from time to time, either to draw upon him the blessing of the father or to avert him from the hatred and persecutions of his brother Esau. Mary, who is the star of the sea, leads all of her faithful children into a safe harbor. She shows them the paths of eternal life. She makes them avoid the dangerous places. She conducts them by her hand along the paths of justice. She steadies them when they are about to fall. She lifts them up when they have fallen. She reproves them like a charitable mother when they fail. And sometimes she even lovingly chastises them. Can a child obedient to Mary, his foster mother, and his enlightened guide go astray in the paths of eternity? If you follow her, says St. Bernard, you cannot wander from the road. 
Fear not, therefore, that a true child of Mary can be deceived by the evil one or fall into any formal heresy. There, where the guidance of Mary is, neither the evil spirit with his, his illusions nor the heretics with their subtleties can ever come. And so this is just such a comforting and reassuring thing to read. And we've talked a lot about this already, how Mary protects us and enlightens our intellect so that we don't fall into formal heresy, which is, you know, disagreeing with one of the teachings of the church. Um, but this, she, he says something here that maybe you've never thought of before, that Mary, being a good mother, sometimes has to discipline her children. You know, um, we, as those of us who are mothers know that that's part of motherhood. It's one of the least favorite parts of motherhood that it has to be done. Um, and, but what I have found with her is she's just so extremely gentle, not like me, you know, not like how I, she doesn't have the impatience or, you know, the uh, anger or whatever thrown in. But, um, you know, this is discipline. You have to distinguish between discipline and punishment. You know, discipline is to teach a lesson. Punishment is to inflict pain, you know. <clears throat> so her, um, the way I look at it is that she allows us to fail sometimes, you know, so to teach us a lesson. And I'm going to encourage you to pray the litany of humility during the 33 days. And a lot of people will come to me and say, boy, I'm just getting humiliated all the time. <laughs> God answers this prayer too much. I don't want to pray this anymore, you know. But um, those are the kinds of um, things that are good for us and that Mary allows. But she's always there to comfort is what I is the beautiful part about it, is when I am down, you know, she might show me that this was for my own good, or I'm trying to teach you something, yeah, yes, you're finally getting it, um, and, I, and then she comes to mother me, you know, like a good mother does, and so, anyway, it's just interesting, if, I don't know if you thought of her in that role, usually it's the mother who's trying to protect the child from the discipline of the father, but she does that too, you know, she's trying to remind us, you know, sometimes we'll say, hurry before dad gets home and do this or that, she does that as well. Okay, um, so then number four, it says she defends and protects them. The fourth good office which Our Lady renders to her children and faithful servants is to protect and defend them against their enemies. Rebecca, by her cares and artifices, delivered Jacob from all the dangers in which he found himself, and particularly from the death which his brother Esau would have inflicted on him because of the envy and hatred which he bore him, as Cain did of old to his brother Abel. Mary, the good mother of the predestinate, hides them under the wings of her protection, as a hen hides her chickens. She speaks, she stoops down to them, she condescends to all their weaknesses, to secure them from the hawk and the vulture. She puts herself round about them and accompanies them like an army in battle array. Shall a man who has an army of a hundred thousand soldiers around him fear his enemies? A faithful servant of Mary, surrounded by her protection and her imperial power, has still less to fear. This good mother and powerful princess of heaven would rather dispatch battalions of millions of angels to assist one of her servants than that it should ever be said that a faithful servant of Mary who trusted in her had to succumb to the malice, the number, and the vehemence of his enemies. I mean, wow, that is just, you, we have to like get this in our heads, you know, as how powerful she is as a queen um, in, in battle and that she protects us and she sends her angels to us and we have to believe that. And he puts, um, you know, he does say that Mary will do this for those who trust in her. So we want to keep praying for an increase of trust in our mother too, um, which is something that we want to pray for during these 33 days is not only to get to know her, but to increase our trust in her as our true mother as she takes care of us. Just such a beautiful paragraph. One thing I want to point out um, that I didn't get until I read uh, Father Lance Harlow's notes on this book. He says, um, where it says here, she, she secures them from the hawk and the vulture. Well, the hawk attacks the living and vultures attack the dead and the dying. And so you can apply that to your soul. And this, when you're in the state of grace and you're living, you know, the hawks try to attack us. Mary protects us from those demons. But then when we commit sin and even maybe fall into mortal sin, then the devils are really after you to keep you there. And she also protects you from the vultures. I just would have never picked that up. <laughs> Had a, I thought, think that's so um, interesting. Okay, so then finally, number, and we have one question, too, left with this section, and this goes with number five. And the answer to number five, um, well, let's read the question, why don't we? And then we can answer it while we're reading this last paragraph. So flip to your questions from last time, and it's... Um, uh, 
It says, what does St. Louis de Montfort say is the greatest service that Mary provides for her faithful children? What specific ways does she do this? So, I mean, we've already read all these great ways. It's hard to imagine there's still something better. But according to St. Louis de Montfort, he says this fifth thing is the very best and greatest thing that Mary does for us. And that is number 211. And this is the answer to number five. If you just want to write, see paragraph 211. Um, it says, lastly, the fifth and greatest good which Mary procures for the faithful clients is that she intercedes for them with her son. Three, three different things that she does. Number one, to appease him by her prayers. Two, to unite them to him in the most intimate union. And three, to keep them unshaken in that union. It says, Rebecca made Jacob draw near to his father's bed. The good man touched him, embraced him, and even kissed him with joy. Being content and satisfied with the well-dressed viands, viands, I don't know what that word is, which the boy had brought him, and having smelt with much contentment the exquisite perfume of his garments, he cried out, Behold the odor of my son, which is like the odor of a full field that the Lord has blessed. This odor of the full field, which charms the heart of the Father, is nothing else than the odor of the virtues and the merits of Mary, who is a field full of grace, where the Father, God the Father has sown his only Son as a grain of wheat of the elect. Oh, how welcome to Jesus Christ, the Father of the world to come, is a child perfumed with the good odor of Mary. Oh, how promptly and how perfectly is this such a child united to the Lord. But we have shown this at length already. And if you want to jot down in your book there, the fifth motive, he's referring to the fifth motive. If you remember, we're still in the motive section. It seems like we've been in it for months. But um, he's referring to the fifth motive there. The fifth motive was that Mary unites us to Jesus. Secure, she's a secure, easy, short, and perfect path to perfect union with Jesus. And so that's what they're referring to there, the fifth motive. And then in 2.12, it says, Furthermore, after Mary has heaped her favors upon her children and faithful servants and has obtained for them the blessing of the Heavenly Father in union with Jesus Christ, she preserves them in Jesus and Jesus in them. She takes care of them, watches over them always for fear they should lose the grace of God and fall into the snares of their enemies. She retains the saints in their fullness and makes them persevere to the end as we have seen. So that as we have seen, if you want to write, is the eighth motive. And the eighth motive was that she helps us to persevere to the end so that if we do fail, she helps us to get up again. And more and more, I'm, I'm starting to see myself as that little child. And that's what we need to do when we mess up. You know, because it's just so hard when we do, when we sin, you know, and we realize that we've sinned and then we beat ourselves up sometimes or sometimes our pride kicks in and, you know, when we're feeling bad for the wrong reasons or whatever it is. But then just to, just more and more, I'm seeing myself as that little, little toddler, you know, who I just, you know, go to mass or go to confession or whatever it is and, and just... I just see God the Father picking me up and scooting me along my way, you know, after I've apologized. So that's what Mary wants us, to see ourselves that way. And that's what's going to help us move forward and persevere so that we don't get stuck, you know, looking back at what we've done and feeling bad. Um, okay, so he says here then, finally, this is the interpretation of the story of Jacob and Esau, that great and ancient figure of predestination and reprobation, so unknown and so full of mysteries. And I want to point to you that footnote, 48, you see it there. I want to read that over on the next page because I just think it's important. It says, the preceding article contains a beautiful exposition of the harmony existing between the childlike way of confidence in God on the one hand and on the other, the way of filial piety toward the Blessed Virgin Mary, as is required by the holy slavery. No real opposition can be established between these different forms of devotion without danger of misunderstanding the nature of the Christian life viewed as a whole. The holy slavery of love is indeed the complete expression of filial love toward our mother Mary, whose great desire is that we be pleasing to God our Father. And underline this last sentence again, so just so that we, so just another good reminder. God is honored by the confidence we place in the mother that he has given to us. Trust in Mary is trust in God. So, you know, there it is again. We and can't say that often enough. Um, but Father, Father Gaffney says, you know, that all this great gifts that we've just read that the Blessed Mother provides, 
for her children, there, there's a hitch. You know, again, it's not a one-time, even not a one-month, 33-day consecration and then we're done kind of thing. You know, it really is to keep reading this book and because there's so much to absorb in one year. I mean, you really need to keep reading it and reading it. And each year, I mean, I get something new every year out of it because it's almost like every sentence is so packed and you can only take in a certain amount. So you'll grow in this and obtain these blessings from the Blessed Mother if you continue. Now, if you do it one time, definitely you'll still receive and by consecrating yourself one time and never doing it again. You're still going to receive, you know, blessings for the Blessed Mother. But um, it really is a journey, as we've said so many times. Okay, so let's move on. We're going to skip the next section and read that in May. It's so beautiful to read that in May anyway. Um, the wonderful effects of this devotion it kind of builds upon the eight motives. Um, but then we're going to go to the, the exercises of this, so the um, practices. So if you can skip ahead then to paragraph um, 226. It's chapter 4. It's the final chapter in the book. Okay, it's divided into two sections. The first is the exterior and, the, and, the, and then the interior. I don't know why... I'd, Seems like you would do the interior first because the exterior are really just a manifestation of the interior. Okay, the exterior are not just, oh, I need to do this, I need to pray this, I'm going to check this off my list. You know, it's not a require. There are no requirements of this devotion. What Saint Lisa Mumford and what Father Gaffney says, as I actually say it here in the first question, is that love has to show itself. You know, and that's why the third, second person of the Trinity took on human flesh because love has to express itself in an exterior way. And us being human, um, you know, that's why the sacraments are, um, you know, bread and wine, things we can touch, see, taste, and, and feel and hear because that is what helps us to um, grow in holiness. So let's read um, Article 1 here. And when he says exterior practices, again, he's not talking about if you remember back when we read about the false devotions, he talked about exterior devotees. This is not about just going through the motions or checking something off a list or, you know, doing this to get it over with. Those are things we want to avoid. Okay, if that's what, if that's how you feel when you're doing your devotions, then maybe you need to pray about doing something else, you know. So, except Mass, you have to go to Mass. <laughs> All right, 226. Although what is essential in this devotion consists in the interior, we must not fail to unite to the inward practices certain external observances. We must do the one, yet not leave the other undone. Because the outward practices well performed aid the inward ones. And because they remind man, who is always guided by his senses, of what he has done or ought to do. And also because they are suitable for edifying our neighbor, who sees them. The, these are things which inward practices cannot do. Let no worldling then or critic intrude here to say that because true devotion is in the heart, we must avoid external devotion, or that devotion ought to be hidden, and that there may be vanity in showing it. I answer with my master that men should see our good works, that they may glorify our Father who is in heaven. Not, as St. Gregory says, that we ought to perform our actions and exterior devotions to please men and get praise, that would be vanity, but that we should sometimes do them before men with the view of pleasing God and glorifying him thereby, without caring either for the contempt or the praise of men. Okay, um, so that's kind of self-explanatory. We do have to, um, you know, express our, our love, again, because... It's impossible to, when you really love someone to keep it to yourself, you know, and that's what, what he's saying here. So let's look at the first question. Um, okay, the new set of questions. It says in 226, and I, this is a little bit of a repeat. I, I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and read it, though. Uh, it says, St. Louis de Montfort states that all this devotion is essentially interior. It also must manifest itself exteriorly. Father Gaffney says, total consecration is about love. How would it even be possible to hide such love? The Trinity's infinite love for us was manifested in the incarnation of the word. Our love in return must be manifested by our words and deeds. St. Louis de Montfort says that it is important to unite the internal and external practices because our inward practices well performed aid the inward ones. I'm sorry, our, yeah, because our outward practices well performed aid the inward ones. And because they remind man who is always guided by his senses of what he has done or ought to do. 
He also says later on in this section, 238, that a man who shapes his course more often by the senses than by pure faith easily forgets his obligations toward God unless he has some outward thing to remind him of them. What external signs does God give us to remind us to be holy? How has the devil attacked these external signs? So as we've already said, the church gives us external things to remind us because we know we're forgetful, you know, and that's why we have sacramentals and holy water and things that we can touch and see and feel. Um, even just the religious garb of priests and, and, the re and religious, you know, it used to be anyway, if you saw a priest or a nun, you would be on your best behavior, right? It's going to remind you. Now, unfortunately, today, a lot of sisters don't wear, um, but I always think of Rosalind Moss. I know I talk about her. I love her. Um, she started a new order of sisters, and she, her, she said, quote, I want to flood the world with habits. Maybe I already said that, but it's just so beautiful. And, um, you know, we just know, and we're blessed at St. Gertrude to have the sisters, but it just does help to remind you, yeah, this, I have a goal, it is to be holy, you know, when we see these things. But in a more general sense, um, and I know you might have a lot of different things written down here, um, but in a, in a general sense, what I want to say is I think that God gives us beauty, the beauty of nature to remind us to be holy, to remind us of him. And that is what, and we can just look at beauty in general, the beauty of music and art that has been attacked by the devil. And so much is so ugly today. You know, and my kids say, oh, you're just old fashioned. And yeah, well, maybe I am. But I also tell them beauty and truth Never go out of style, you know. And I know beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but God is beauty. And I think I mentioned this earlier in the year. It just stuck with me, and it still does to this day. And I apologize for repeating myself, but I was at my daughter's Irish dancing recital, and I was reading my Magnificat, and it said, every, um, everything that we see in the world, every talent is just a reflection. Every beauty is a reflection of God. And so it just has helped me so much now. Whenever I hear beautiful music or see beautiful art, I always just think this is just a ref tiny reflection, especially music. I love music so much. And my, my kids all play, I grew up playing the piano. My kids all play the piano. My kids are in the band. And we're just a very musical family. But there's almost never a day now that goes by that I don't thank the Lord for the gift of music, the beautiful music. And so, um, the devil is attacking beauty like crazy. Our kids are not seeing beauty. That's why it's very important in your home to expose your children to beautiful art, beautiful music, beautiful statues, beautiful, you know, beautiful poetry, whatever it is, to expose them to beauty because they're not getting it in the world. I mean, even, and I know I say this every year, but it bugs me, even cartoons, you know? Like when I was growing up, we had Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, you know? It's like, they were cute. And now it's like the characters are so ugly. They're so hideous. And there has to be something behind that. I mean, I think that's the desensitization of what is beautiful. One of my favorite verses in scripture is St. Paul. And my mother-in-law has this cross-stitched hanging on her wall. It's one of my favorites. St. Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And I've talked about that, to try to keep our, our eyes focused on beauty. And you know, right after the Second Vatican Council, so many of the churches removed statues and and you know, I know they had good intentions, but really it was a twisted intention. It was to not distract us, but actually they were doing just the opposite because those statues and those beautiful things helped to elevate our soul toward God. And I remember when I was a little girl, our church was so beautiful and we had uh, angels were on the ceiling above the altar, clouds and angels. And I just remember being a little girl looking up at that and just, I wouldn't pay attention to anything else. I would just look at the angels and would just be so you know, amaze. Well, right at, in the 70s, they painted it purple. To this day, it is purple. It's gone. And, well, you know, how heartbreaking I remember I was at the time. And But that's happened all over the country, maybe all over the world, you know. And thank God it's turning around. Statues are coming back. Tabernacles are being put back and all of these things. Praise the Lord. But, um, you know, it was just a mis, um, well, misunderstanding of the Vatican Council for sure. But, um Okay, uh, that is Philippians 4.8.
what I just read about St. Paul. And even we see like Mother Angelica, or actually the Old Testament, if you read about the temple and the ark and just how beautiful they made it, covered in gold, and you know, that's just to give glory to God. Um, and Mother Angelica, as I was as you have probably heard, you know, she said, nothing's too good for Jesus, you know. So she had her tabernacles, it's all gold and so beautiful. And we're very blessed uh, at St. Gertrude. Our pastor has just, his focus is to beautify everything. He's, you know, redone the parish center and, and the church is just absolutely gorgeous. And I just, I'm just so thankful. I mean, especially right now, if you get a chance to go look in St. Gertrude during the Easter season, I mean, he, it is just stunning how he has at Christmas. And I am so thankful for that because it really lifts my soul is what it does. And that's what beauty is intended to do. So just be aware that the devil is attacking this. I mean, it's obviously, I don't have to convince you, but as we've said, let's try to focus on beauty. Let's try to bring that into our families. Let's try to, you know, as much as we can, put pictures and statues and music, have music, beautiful music. And okay, I know we all have our own thing that we, we like. Um, but to focus on beauty and to realize that it is being attacked and that our children are not growing up, you know, seeing and hearing the beauty that we had. And so we need to try as much as we can. Um, okay. And Pope Benedict, when he was um, Cardinal Ratzinger, wrote, um, like it wasn't an encyclical, but it was a letter, I guess, called Contemplating Beauty. So if you ever want to get that out. I think it was a letter to artists. I have a good friend who's an artist, and she just talked about this all the time, Contemplating Beauty. Okay. All right. So let's go on. Um, this next part now is about total consecration. Or the 33 days is coming up next this weekend. Um, and I, if, you, if you're coming on the 30th and you want to start your prayers on the 27th, you know, that's okay. You can still start them on the 28th if you want and just say your prayer in the morning and your consecration, you know, at mass, however you want to do it. But um, with that starts this weekend. So it's a real blessing to have this section here. Um, well, let's read first and then I'll just kind of go through it. The 33 days is divided up into four sections, okay? So I'm gonna spend the most time on the first section because then when I see you next time, we can talk more about the, the other sections. Um, but I realize that I, I skipped the paragraph here. Oh, well, anyway, this last paragraph of 226 reads, I will allude only briefly to some exterior practices which I call exterior, not because we did not perform them interiorly, but because they have something outward about them to distinguish them from those which are purely inward. Okay, so this preparatory exercises and consecration, he discusses the 33 days, and just a couple things I want to tell you ahead of time. Um, if you remember earlier in the year, we talked about his work, this book, ha there, the first part is missing. 90 pages of this book have never been found and how I wish someday that it would appear. Because he talks about this constant 33 days. He talks about how to do it, and it's lost. So he only gives us a really brief here because he, he says, oh, just read what I wrote in the first part, which we don't have. So I wanna point that out before I start reading. Um, the second thing that Father Gaffney said was that St. Louis de Montfort assumes you've read the book. Now I know a lot of people haven't made it to all the meetings, haven't had time to read the whole book, and I wanna encourage you to make the 33 days anyway. But what St. Louis de, or what, what Father Gaffney said is that any consecration to our Blessed Mother is called an entrustment. So you're, you're entrusting yourself to her care, her special protection, you entrust your family. But he said to fully understand this book and to make a total consecration I mean, which you can't understand through, with one read, even 10 reads. I mean, it's a lifetime to understand the entire thing. But anyway, he says what he calls that is more than an entrustment. He calls it an adoration consecration. And I love that so much because Mary is perpetually in adoration of her son. And so she teaches you to adore her son. And that's deeper than just an entrustment. And that's why it is important to read the book. But please, you have to start somewhere. Make the consecration, even if you haven't read the book, and you can always read the book later. Um, or, you know, God willing, I'll be doing this again next year. As far as I know right now, same place, same time, same locations. If that changes, I'll let you know over the summer. But um, anyway, so I wanted to mention that, that this is much, this, this leads us, as a matter of fact, I'll just read to you really quick uh, what, what Father Gaffney says. He says, okay, St. Louis de Montfort's formula 
for total consecration is much more than just an entrustment to Mary's care. He calls it an adoration consecration because through this devotion, properly lived and practiced, Mary leads you into a deeper contemplation and adoration of the Blessed Trinity. So that's what is such a gift. Um, and I just remembered that I skipped something. <laughs> or is it coming? Yeah, shucks. Oh, well, that's all right. I'll just say, when we were talking about um, in the last question of the last section, how Mary leads us to that last question, or she appeases the Father for us. Remember, she keeps us in union with Jesus. She, she brings us to union with Jesus and then keeps us in that union. What I forgot to say was that I wanted to read you what Father Basil Cole said. He says, Mary has already appeased all sinners at the foot of the cross. Her prayers now apply that appeasement to those who pray to her. It's not a new act on her part. So that's just a, a technicality that she uh, appease means to calm or to placate, you know, um, the father. But what, what I really want to talk about is that the second, which is, um, and we've talked about this, I know so much, but that this union with Jesus is not about just being a good Catholic or, you know, going to mass more, going to adoration more, but, uh, you know, following the rules. It's actually about a relationship with, with Jesus, the person of Christ. And that's why this reminded me of it, this whole adoration consecration, because it is about a relationship with, with Jesus. And then she keeps us in that relationship. And St. Faustina's diary has really helped me understand this more and more, this, this relationship with Christ. Because if you read her diary, you see that she, it, it's, a pain, it's painful for her even just to do her duties of her state because she doesn't want to leave the presence of Christ. She doesn't want to leave her times of contemplation. She has so much love for Jesus that she just wants to be, you know, have that union with Christ. And so that's what this leads to. And we can't get there on our own. I mean, we just cannot. But the Blessed Mother spent her entire life and all eternity adoring Christ perfectly so she knows how and she can teach us. And, um, you know, make that part of your daily prayer. You know, increase my union. You know, as I say, every, at every Mass, as much as I can, you know, increase my faith in this year of faith because that's really what it is. It's faith. It's faith in the true presence. Okay. So let's start reading here, 227. It says, those who wish to enter into this particular devotion, which is not at present erected into a confraternity, well, it is now, this was then, <laughs> though that were to be wished, after having, as I said, in the first, here we go, in the first part of this preparation for the reign of Jesus Christ, employed 12 days at least in ridding themselves of the spirit of the world, which is contrary to the spirit of Jesus Christ. We should employ three weeks in filling themselves with Jesus Christ by the Holy Virgin. They can follow this order. So you can see that's just like one sentence there on the 12 days. So I want to give you a little bit more. Since that's what we're starting, um, I want to read you. It took me two hours to find this the other day because I was like, oh, my gosh. My daughter and my kids were all praying to St. Anthony. And um, I finally thought, well, you know, maybe I'm just not supposed to read it. But then I, boom, I found it. As soon as I gave in, you see, as soon as you're like, well, maybe, Lord, it's your will, boom, I found it. You know, that's what he wants us to do. He does that a lot. Have you noticed? Okay, so Father Hugh Gillespie is a Montfort father, and he came to Cincinnati in this past summer and, and gave a one-day uh, retreat on these 33 days. Anybody there? Good. Okay. I had one person yesterday. Oh, you were there too. Okay. Yeah, um, anyway, it was fabulous. And I learned so much. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit of what he said about this first period, which is the 12 days. Okay. He said, and I'm just the 12 days and other things that he said, these are from my notes from that conference. Um, he said, First of all, just about the 33 days itself and all the options that we have. Okay, he says that St. Louis de Montfort was not a law giver. In, in other words, it's not a set way that you have to do these 33 days. You know, there, that's why he came up with the gray book, which is really entirely different from the little brown book or even what's in the back of this book. And he's a Montfort father. And so he says, but 
it is important for us to make it a high priority. You know, these, it's like a retreat. We want to take it seriously. It's best to carve out a certain, it's, it's best to carve out the same time each day. Because if you just say, oh, if I get to it today, you will not get to it. And I'll warn you right now that you, the devil doesn't want you to do this. And he will make you so busy so much busier than you are right now that you can barely fit this in. And that's why I say do it in the morning. <laughs> because if you wait later in the day, then it is very difficult to, to fit it in, just from my own experience for some reason. Um, he will try to discourage you. The devil, you have to know this. I'm warning you ahead of time. You know, he will try to discourage you that if you miss a day or if you miss a couple days or if you haven't been here this year, oh, I'll wait till next year. I have had so many people come to me after the first one or two weeks and say, you know, I'm just going to wait till next year. No, 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 no. Don't don't wait till next year. Mary wants you now. She wants your prayers now. You know enough. You know enough to know, even if you miss a bunch of meetings, you know enough to know that when you consecrate, you're giving her all your prayers. And that's all you need to know right now. You know, everything else, it'll come. You'll learn later. But she wants your prayer. She needs your prayer. She needs your sacrifices because she's going out to save souls. Okay, so don't not do this, okay, even if you miss a lot. And I know sometimes life throws crazy things at us, or God, I guess, <laughs> not life. Let's, let's use the right terminology, right? God throws things at us, and um, we do the best we can. Do the best you can. And don't, he says, Father Hugh says, avoid worry and scrupulosity, okay? So we don't want to just, you know, and I've done this. I got two litanies, and I'm just reading them as fast as I can, just get them over with, you know, um, which I guess there is some merit in that. I'm still praying it, but you know, um, do the best you can and don't worry too much about it. Okay. He says the 33 days symbolizes the life of Christ. That's where we get the 33. Maybe I said that earlier in the year, but, um, um, he said the most important thing that we should get out of the 33 days or really from reading the book in general is St. Louis of Montfort's spirituality, which is really two things, two things. Number one, we die to the spirit of the world. We die to self. We cast it off. That's a lifetime, but that's the first part, and that has to come first. And then once we've emptied ourselves, then to fill up with the spirit of Christ, and we do this but with Mary's help. Okay, so Mary's not our goal here. Mary's just our helper. Our goal is to fill up with the spirit of Christ. That's the twofold spirituality of St. Louis de Montfort. And so we begin with these 12 days of self-knowledge, of figuring out what, how have I been sucked into the spirit of the world? I heard on the radio, Sacred Heart Radio, someone said, we're not only influenced by the world, we've been, somebody hear this, I forget the words, we've been bleached and digested by the world or whatever the quote was. So it's not just a little bit of an influence. I mean, we've all been sucked into this world. And so we spend these 12 days really reflecting on, and, and he says, you know, we want to make this like another Lent in a way. We want to try to give up little things and find out which things are the hardest to give up. You know, so he's like, turn off your computer for a day and see how much you miss it. Or turn off the TV for a day and just test yourself. How much do you miss it? Don't read the newspaper for a day. How much do you miss it? Don't drink your coffee for a day. And kind of gauge. And these aren't like necessarily the spirit of the world, but it can be inordinate attachments, okay? But here's what he says. He says, we don't own ourselves. We didn't choose our parents. We are not the master of our own life. We discover where our weaknesses are, and that is our point of contact with Mary. And I love that, because it's like once we, we can pray to Mary our whole life, but it's not until we really start to have a need that we can go to her as mother, right? I mean, we go to our mother, our natural mother, when we have a need, okay? And so it's discovering that you have a need, that you can't change on your own, that you're weak, that you need help. You know, it's in whatever area it is. We all have different areas. It's, and that is where we meet our mother. That's where she comes to us. This is what Father Hugh said. He says, recognize your need for grace. He said, there are hurts that dwell in us more deeply than our joys in our life. We are fragile. We are easily robbed of grace. And that Mary, I love this. He says, Mary is as near to, our, to us as our need for grace. She is as near to us as the blessings that we are in need of. Okay, so how do we renounce the spirit of the world? Okay, here's what he says. First, he, he, ge he gives Jesus' quote to Peter. You are not thinking as God, but as the world thinks. 
So what's he mean? Well, the world is opposed to the cross. We know that. We've talked about that a lot. He says the cross without Jesus equals pain. Jesus without the cross equals a fantasy. So we need both. You know, it, the world makes Jesus the way they want you know, their own Jesus, and they avoid the cross. Okay, here's what he says, the spirit of the world. The spirit of the world values self-seeking, self-serving, self-absorption, self-interest, self-indulgence, self-gratification, self-asserting, self-deceiving. Let me read that again. And I was so glad I wrote it down because I was... <laughs> self-seeking, self-serving, self-absorption or absorbed self-interest self-indulgence self-gratification self-assertion assertion asserting and self-deception self-deceiving okay he said the spirit of the world is that we need to be understood you need to understand me right that's the spirit of the world the spirit of the world needs to be consoled you need to console me and I will help you as long as it doesn't inconvenience me, right? That's really the spirit of the world. It doesn't say it that way, but I will help you as long as it can help me to get ahead. Okay, this is the spirit of the world. Okay, the spirit of the world does not understand self-sacrifice and looks upon it as, what, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? They don't understand it. Okay, so he said, the spirit of the world is self-preservation, they don't risk anything. The spirit of the world is a false compassion. Je Jesus says, to preserve your life, you must lose it. So Jesus is not talking about self-destruction here, but he is talking about getting rid of exaggerated self-worth. And Father Basil Cole yesterday was, he gave a homily, and he said that... Um, Faith, he was talking about the year of faith, so it was really great. He said, faith requires a sacrifice of the intellect. And that's what the world refuses to do. The world says, I will figure it out for myself. I will come to my own truths. And that's, you know, they make them, the world, you make yourself a god, really. You decide what's good for you. And that's what, you know, moral relativism, we, we know that, moral relativism. Okay, um, Father Basil Cole also said that faith is a surrender of our own eminence. So again, he's, uh, Father Hugh says, the spirit of the world is a frightened spirit. He says, most people keep quiet in the face of wrongdoing. The spirit of the world is, does not like confrontation. Okay, lacks courage. And then he said, take your doubts to Jesus and don't gossip. <laughs> Don't complain even on the inside. Did you love that? I have been saying that to myself every day. Don't complain even on the inside, Father John Harden. I love him. Um, it says, do not run away from rebukes. You know, we have to have the courage to be corrected by others. He said, Peter does not shut down, but he stays close to Jesus. He takes a risk for Jesus. So that's what it's about, taking a risk for Jesus. And then he goes on to say, Father Hugh says, that there is no way you can offer your life to the Lord if you're not willing to offer your time to the Lord. You know, we cannot build a relationship with someone. It's no different than the relationships we have here on earth. We need to spend time. He said, what claims your time claims you. So that's something we want to look at during these 12 days. You know, what are you spending your free time doing? Not your duties of your state, obviously, but when you have free time. I thought that was an interesting quote. What claims your time claims you. You know, is it the Lord? Okay, he says 33 days is a chunk of time, and it's time given over to the Lord, and it requires that we set aside a certain amount of time, and I want to tell you this, and I'm so glad that he says this too, because I was going to tell you this anyway, during the 33 days, and I've already said add the litany of humility, at least for the first and second period, litany of humility, if you, you know, by, but when you get to the end and you got too many litanies, you can drop it, but this first 12 days, litany of humility, and then the first per the period after that, which is knowledge of self, Pray that litany of humility. But the second thing I want to suggest is that you each day begin, if you haven't yet, to close your eyes, spend that quiet time where you're done reading, you're done praying now, and you just allow that five minutes even 
to be with the Lord. Because Father Hugh says, listening is loving. I love that. I want to write that down in my house. <laughs> listening is loving. It requires stepping aside. And I love this. He says, listening to the Lord is the hidden heartbeat of true devotion to Mary. Learning to, you know, most people don't know that God can talk to them. Catholics, Christians, they have no idea that God can actually talk to you. You know, and so Mary teaches us to get into that quiet place where we can hear the Lord. Okay, so that's what... I just think this is so awesome. Okay, he says, obviously it takes discipline to set aside a time for, for the Lord. He said, it doesn't have to be a lot of time. Okay, set, do not set unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. You know, 15 minutes, I think is a good amount of time in the morning. If you can get up 15 minutes earlier or whatever, you know, if you have little ones, then you gotta squeeze it in during nap time or whatever. I used to have to, you know, just do it when I could or I'd break it up throughout the day or whatever. Um, 15 minutes isn't, you know, or some people can do a whole hour, you know. Okay, he says, give God what you can. Um, and then he does say, give something up during this 33 days. Because I think this is a really good quote. And this is from St. Um, Father Gaffney. He says, or actually, I'm not sure where I got this quote. But self-denial is a powerful tool to combat self-absorption. You know, because if we're not, think about it, if you're not denying yourself, you're deceiving yourself and you're being self-absorbed and you don't even know it. Think about that. Because when you start denying yourself, you start seeing things that you can't see if you're not denying yourself. Because self-denial then, it wakes you up to yourself. Because you, you, you're, it's a struggle. And you, and you see where your weaknesses are. Okay, so if we're living our lives without any self-denial whatsoever, we're deceived we don't even know what our weaknesses are. We don't even know. So, um, okay, he says, okay, so, and I say that too every year um, to give something up. He says, if you can't say no to yourself, it's, you can't say yes to others. Okay, so let's keep reading. Um, if you have the little gray book, and I plan to use the gray book plus all the prayers in the back of this book. I love the prayers that St. Louis de Montfort, and we're going to read them right here. He tells us which prayers that he says that we should say. So um, granted, if, if multiple litanies is too hard, just pick one. I mean, I think it's litanies are beautiful. I didn't before, but now I love them. I treasure them. So don't say multiple litanies if that's too hard, but pick one. You know, on the week of Mary, say the litany of the Blessed Mother. On the week of Jesus, say the litany of the Sacred Heart. You know, um, during this time of getting to know ourselves, Father Hughes suggests the litany of the saints, and that's new. That's, that's, that's a great idea. I do also want to encourage you to pray some sort of prayer to the Holy Spirit. My favorite is still the Vini Creator, which he, it's the Come Holy Ghost song, you know. This is my favorite prayer, probably, other than, well, I have so many favorite prayers, but during this 33 days, and what I do is I, I actually have memorized the Ave Maris Stella and the Vini Creator, which are the two prayers that he suggests we pray during these, St. Louis de Montfort suggests we pray during these um, 33 days, and they are in the back of the book, and somebody was asking me what page yesterday, but um, if somebody wants to find that for me really quick, then I can tell you what page that's on. But anyway, um, the Litany of the Holy Ghost is another beautiful one because what is so exciting is that we celebrate Pentecost during this 33 days. And this year, it's during the week of Mary. This never happened before because we had an early Easter, at least that I can remember. It's usually during the week of Jesus, which is fabulous. Um, but it's during the week of Mary, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, which I just think is so you know, such a gift. So I love Pentecost is, is truly because of this book, because Mary's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is one of my absolute favorite feast days of the year. I mean, I make my family, they all wear red and they kind of get mad at me now because I still make them, we got to wear red. And they're like, we're not wearing red. But anyway, um, but the gray book does not have all of them. Okay. So you'll need to, to refer. Okay. Page 149 is the um, Ave Maristella and the Vini Creator prayer, the Come Holy Ghost 
and the, and Ave Maria Stella to me, I can see why St. Louis de Montfort put that in there. That is, I, I pray that almost every day at mass before I go to communion. It's just, it's just such a beautiful prayer. And, I, and so I can see why he, I can see why he picked those two prayers because I love those two prayers myself so much. Those two prayers. I actually say them throughout the 33 days and then beyond. But, um, you know, again, I don't want anyone to get overwhelmed during this time. So, you know, it depends on how much time you have. Sometimes I read a little bit out of the 33 days, the morning glory. Well, last year I did that for the first time. The year before that, I did the Catholic family land. But I always would come back to these prayers because I just love them. I've been praying them for 20 years. So I love all the litanies. I love all the prayers. If you're new, you might take one look at those prayers and say, forget it, you know? And that's fine. It really is fine, okay? I don't want, there's no rules, there's no hard and fast rules, okay, of what you have to do for these 33 days. If you can just read the gray book, fine. If you wanna use the um, My Consecration app, it's got all the prayers in the book. So you can just maybe use that. Although I'm trying to figure out how if I can use that at church. And I'm thinking I probably shouldn't. <laughs> no one's going to know that I'm praying and they'll think I'm texting or something. All right. Um, let's go on. So that's the 12 days. That's what we start this weekend. And then the second, then there's three more periods. I'm going to watch the time here. So then the next period is called Knowledge of Self. Okay, and that's paragraph 228. And this paragraph is that really harsh paragraph where he calls us animal names again. And, um, <laughs> but I'm starting to get this more and more, and I'm so happy because w when he, you know, compares us to all these animals, what he's really saying is obviously he's not insulting our human dignity, but he's saying us to look at the characteristic that that animal has. And it's the seven capital sins. So during the second week, be sure to look up Google or get a book on the seven capital sins and pick one. You know, I mean, you're going to find that you have maybe all seven, you know, I mean, <laughs> we all do though. We all have something of the all seven, we do. And so, but there's usually one that stands out. And so when he calls us, you know, swine, well, he's obviously referring to gluttony, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, I'm finally getting this, you know? So it doesn't bother me to read this at all because I understand what he's saying here. He's really not trying to insult, to insult. He's trying to help us to see what characteristics. So when he calls us snails, he's talking about sloth, right? I mean, don't you think? I mean, I think that's why. Okay, so we're going to read this in uh, 228. So during the first week, which is really after the 12 days, I don't know why they call it the first week, but it's a full week. He says they should offer up all their prayers and pious actions to ask for a knowledge of themselves and contrition for their sins. And they should do this in a spirit of humility. So maybe add the act of contrition during this week too at the end of the day. For that end, they can, if they choose, meditate on what I have said before of our own inward corruption. They can look upon themselves during this, these six days as snails, crawling things, toads, swine, serpents, and unclean animals. Nice. Or they can reflect on these three considerations of St. Bernard. The vileness of our origin, which would be original sin. The dishonors of our present state, which would be our actual sins. And our ending as a food of worms. Okay, that's nice. But we hear every Ash Wednesday, right? Until dust you, your man, you are dust, and dust you shall return. So that shouldn't be so. You know, we hear that every year. Um, okay, they should pray that our Lord and the Holy Ghost to enlighten them. And for that end, they might use ejaculations such as, Lord, that I might see, or that may I know myself, or come Holy Ghost, together with the litany of the Holy Ghost and the prayer which follows, as indicated in the first part of this work, which is missing. They should have recourse to the Blessed Virgin and ask her to grant them this immense grace, which must be the foundation of all others. For this end, they should say daily, the Ave Maris Stella, and the litany of the Blessed Virgin. So, again, pick one of those if you don't want to, if you don't have time for all of them. Um, some people have a lot of time. You might really enjoy all these prayers. Um, but anyway, you, you notice how this is not just, don't make this just your 15 minutes in the morning. It really should be all throughout the day. You know, if you're praying the litany of humility, trust me, you will be thinking of this throughout the day <laughs> because things will happen. Um, but, um, you know, Make those short little prayers that our generation really hasn't been taught as much where, you know, in the old days, 
you would say a hundred times a day a certain you know short prayer. And as a matter of fact, just last night, I didn't sleep at all because the Blessed Mother wanted me to make this point to you to do this. So she woke me up about a hundred times and then just, I was of course asleep. I mean, I wasn't, but I kept praying, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I love you, save souls. So I think I said that a hundred times last night so that I could point out to you that these are very efficacious prayers. And, you know, maybe there were souls in the middle of the night that really needed that prayer. And given it to Mary, you know, you can only imagine how many souls. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I love you, save souls. I've read that. And that wasn't something, it just came to me in the middle of the night. She put that in my heart to pray. So do that, okay? Maybe if you want to write down or just Jesus, I trust in you or whatever comes to your heart, you know, God, come to my assistance. So Lord, make haste to help me. I say that a lot. But reveal myself to me, you want to say during that week. Okay, so then the next week is, it says during the second week, which is really the third period, they should apply themselves and all their prayers and works each day to know the Blessed Virgin. They should ask this knowledge of the Holy Ghost. They should read and, and meditate on what we have said about it. For this intention, they should recite, as in the first week, the Litany of the Holy Ghost and the Ave Maristella, and in addition, the Rosary daily, or if not the whole Rosary, at least the beads. So the whole Rosary is the 20, 20 decades, which is what he said. So the beads, I still haven't been able to find clarification, but I think that just means one of the mysteries, so like the joyful or the sorrowful. If you can't pray all 20, imagine that, you know, <laughs> just... But anyway, you know, maybe the daily rosary is part of your day anyway. This is not really an addition. Or if you can just say a decade of the rosary, you know, during that week of Mary. I think it's important to at least pray that decade during the week of Mary. But something I suggested that's kind of new this year that Mary put on my heart was that pray to a Marian saint each day of that Marian week to help you. So, you know, like pray to the 33 days has obviously St. Louis de Montfort just throughout the day. St. Louis de Montfort helped me to know Mary. St. Maximilian Colby, Blessed John Paul II, Blessed Mother Teresa. You know, there's lots. Um, someone yesterday said St. Dominic's statue was right behind me. I can't believe you didn't say St. Dominic. St. Dominic, of course. It, um, but anyway, someone sent me an email yesterday. This is amazing. But these little pictures, I brought them again today of St. Gemma. Someone sent me an email yesterday. Oh, my gosh. Her devotion to Mary. Unbelievable. So beautiful. Mary appeared to her many times in her short life. And so I'm going to send that to you. But one of the, one of the um, times Mary came, she had all these jewels in her crown that represented all her virtues. But she had something in her crown that St. Gemma could not describe, but it represented that Mary is dispensatrix of all grace. And I thought, oh my gosh, there it is. <laughs> she appeared to St. Gemma to, to give this truth that we've been talking about. Um, so... I will email that to you, St. Gemma. What's that? The little three-year-old, right, his name was Gemma. So I... The real Gemma, the St. Gemma. Oh, St. Gianna. St. Gianna's feast day is the same day as St. Louis de Montfort, the 28th, and she gave her life, right, for her baby. Um, I'm actually praying a novena to her right now for someone. Um, but pray to Saint, I'm going to be praying to St. Gemma, because I just received this information, and which I will send to you. Um, but anyway, and even if you want to, all 33 days, you can pick a saint each day to help you during the week of Jesus, which is the fourth period. I'm thinking maybe pick one of the 12 apostles. Those who knew him, those who lived with him, those who can really teach you who he is, you know, the, the people who live with him or Lazarus, or, you know, Mary and Martha, people like that. Um, That's just something new that Mary put on my heart this year to, to say. Also during this week of Mary, um, if you can, and I'll remind you, is, is meditate maybe once a day or, or on one of her virtues. I was just driving here this morning, I don't know if any of you heard on Sacred Heart Radio, uh, at the very end of the hour, uh, a lady wrote a book called um, Mary's Virtues for Mothers. And it was looking at all the events in Mary's life and how we can as mothers, so patience was number one, of course. But anyway, um, I thought, well, there you go, that just to meditate on her virtues, which St. Louis de Montfort gives us earlier in the book. So when we get to that part of the 33 days, I'll remind you. And then 2.30 is the last um, part. It says they should apply themselves during the third and final week to know Jesus Christ. They can meditate upon what we have said about him and say the prayer of St. Augustine, which they will find in the beginning of the second part of this treatise. And that's paragraph 67, if you want to write it down. It was a prayer of St. Augustine that he included in this book, which is very beautiful. 
Okay, it says they can with the same time repeat a hundred times a day. Here we have again that short prayers. Lord, that I may know thee. Lord, that I may see who thou art. They should recite, as in the preceding weeks, the litany of the Holy Ghost and the Ave Maris Stella. And they should add daily the litany of the holy name of Jesus. So he obviously likes litanies. A lot of people don't. You know, if you don't, that's okay. Um, I love them now. I didn't. I used to think this was a real burden. I mean, I did. I would just do it. But um, I love it now, even though it's much harder now. I'm much more busy now than I was when I first started doing this. But I love the litanies, and I wish I had more time so that I could really meditate on each title of Mary, on each aspect of Jesus. That's how we get to know them. And really, that's what the litanies are good for, because it, it lists all the different titles, all the different aspects. And so you get to really meditate on each little title of Jesus or Mary, of his heart, of his name, the holy name. And so I, I love them. Um, but again, do what you can. Um, okay, now the 33 days, as I mentioned, has no prayers whatsoever. So if you if you chose the 33 days to morning glory, you'll have to get your prayers somewhere. Uh, I was, you know, from the book or whatever. Okay, and then it says on 231, at the end of the three weeks, they should go to confession and communion with the intention of giving themselves to Jesus Christ and the quality of slaves of love by the hands of Mary. After communion, which they should try to make according to the method given further on which we'll look at later they should recite the formula of their consecration which they will also find further on they ought to write it or have it written unless they have a printed copy of it and they should sign it on the same day on which they have made it so in the past i have printed off the prayer for us to use because it's different it's worded differently in every book and, you know, if you have the old English, you have the modern version. So I, if you come on the 30th, I will be handing out a prayer that we can say together. You can sign your name and date it and then have it as a, you know, a keepsake. Um, so I'll do that. But he says here at the end of this, we should go to confession. I like to try to go to confession every week during these 33 days because that just opens your eyes even more to yourself, helps you to see Mary and Jesus even more. That might not be possible for all of us, but I'm just something that I try to do. Um, but at least we want to go at least once during this time. And I know we just had Lent, and it's, but I kind of am ready for Lent again. <laughs> I got kind of indulged after Easter came, you know, <laughs> like, all right, I'm ready to like be forced to do some more self-denial here. So um, anyway, 232. And then finally he says, well, two more points here. It would be well also that on the day of your consecration, you should pay some tribute to Jesus Christ and our blessed lady, either as a penance for your past unfaithfulness to the vows of your baptism, or as a testimony of your dependence and the, on the dominion of Jesus and Mary. This tribute ought to be according to the devotion and ability of each one, such as a fast, a mortification, an alms, or a candle. If they had but a pen to give in homage and gave it with a good heart, it would be enough for Jesus, who looks only at the good will. So this is something that you can pray about, you know. I, I ran into a lady, let's see if she's here today. She's not here. Anyway, I, so so precious. I ran into her and she's the one who said 31st, 8 o'clock, right? I'm like, oh gosh, no. She's like, I just told a bunch of people. Oh, go back and tell them. <laughs> but um, she, um, she had a bucket with a, a sponge in it and she was going into the church and she's like, I'm doing my, my yearly tribute or, you know, an honor. And what she does every year for her consecration is she scrubs down the wall of the Holy Family Chapel for all the soot off the statues, off their faces, and off the walls. And she does it every year as her act of love to Jesus and Mary. And I thought, oh, I need to, like, pray about this a little bit more. But anyway, I mean, I... But I just thought that was so beautiful. You know, so beautiful. But, you know, this is optional, and not optional per se, but meaning that you choose, you pray about it. You can bring flowers to her altar. I do that sometimes. Um, I, sometimes I'll pray all 20 decades. You know, that'll be my tribute. Or the little crown. I do say that once a year, and usually I use that as my tribute. Because the little crown we're going to talk about in a minute is a prayer in the back of this book. That you're, there's, you're not asking for anything. That's what I love it. You're just simply honoring the Blessed Mother. So, and the Magnificat is the same. You know, a prayer of, of honor, of praise as well. Okay, um, so then finally he says here, 233, once a year at least, or on the same day, they should renew their consecration, observing the same practices during the three weeks. They might also, once a month or even once a day, renew all they have done in these few words, I, I am all thine and all I have is thine, O most loving Jesus, through Mary, thy most holy mother. And I suggest that you pray this prayer every single day. Renew your consecration every single day. Not once a month, not once a year. 
daily. Because if you do, St. Louis de Montfort tells us later, you will grow faster in this devotion because you will be reminding yourself that you've given yourself over to her. So there's, at the end of the month, next month, I'll give you little daily prayers that I say that just if you want to or you pray about whatever um, prayer you want to say. You can simply say, you know, when you get up, I, I give myself to you. Mary, I give myself to you, Jesus, through the hands of Mary, in your own words. But that's a little, you know, renewal of your consecration. Okay, so we'll talk more as we go on. Um, you know, feel free to email me or any of our veterans here who have been doing this for a long time. Um, they can answer your questions um, if you have any while you're going through the 33 days. But don't give up, you know, persevere. It does not have to be perfect. Mary does not want you to feel overwhelmed. She does not want you to, you know, not do your duties of your state. She does not want you to feel bad at all. You know, this is a, supposed to be a joyful time. But because of the spiritual warfare going on, it usually will, you usually will feel something pulling you away from this. So just be warned. <laughs> okay, he goes on then. The recitation of the little crown of the Blessed Virgin. Um... We're not going to read a whole lot of this, but uh, I have to skip a few paragraphs today since we're getting short on time. But anyway, he says, they may recite every day of their life without, however, making a burden of it, the little crown of the Blessed Virgin, composed of three Our Fathers and twelve Hail Marys in honor of Our Lady's twelve privileges and grandeurs. This is a very ancient practice and has its foundation in Holy Scripture. St. John saw a woman crowned with the twelve stars, clothed with the sun, and with the moon under her feet. And this woman, according to the interpreters, was the most holy virgin. So if you have this book, it's in the back. It's on page 287. Okay, and it just, it, actually, I, I, question number two, we'll just look at it real quick. It says, St. Louis of Montfort describes the little crown of the Blessed Virgin. What are Mary's twelve privileges and grandeurs? Now, this is an ancient prayer. I don't, St. Louis de Montfort did not come up with this prayer. So I don't know who came up with these 12, but here they are, and they're in the back of the book. Her divine maternity, and you can look these up later. Her ineffable virginity, and the word ineffable, ineffable, okay, I can't even say it. Ineffable, what that means is incapable of being described. Sorry, her ineffable virginity, her purity without stain, her innumerable virtues, her royalty, which means her queenship, her magnificence, her universal mediation, the strength of her rule, her mercy toward sinners, toward the poor, toward the just, and toward the dying, the mother of mercy. So if you have this book, it's 289. Any book you have, it's in there. You just have to find it. It's in the back. It's in every book. 200 and another one. Yeah, I can't hold it up right now. Oh, it's, it's just read it later. It's all in there. It li it's in the parentheses. It lists all 12 of those. You didn't do your questions. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. All right. So I'm going to skip that next paragraph and go on to the wearing of little chains. Now, this is interesting. Um, interesting because St. Louis de Montfort kind of cracks me up here. Because he, he says it's not necessary, but then he devotes like eight paragraphs to it. <laughs> which is funny because he spends the most time on this section right here. But anyway, um, I'll just start reading here. And then it says, It is a most glorious and praiseworthy thing and very useful to those who have thus made themselves slaves of Jesus and Mary, that they should wear it. As a sign of their loving slavery, little iron chains, blessed with the proper blessing. And, you know, and you'll see the footnote there saying that this is not necessary. Even the Montfort Fathers, they don't distribute any kind of chains or anything like that. But the modern day, you know, I guess doing this practice would just be wearing, you know, a necklace with the cross and the miraculous medal or a bracelet an anklet, a ring, you know, a pin, something that just shows your devotion. It is not necessary, but it's just sort of an act of love. Remember, all these come from the internal love, right? So the internal love you have may, may inspire you to want to show the world that you're a slave of Jesus and Mary, you know, and that's, so that's what the chain represents. Now, of course, 
a lot of people aren't going to look at your necklace and say, she's a slave of Jesus and Mary because, you know, it's jewelry today. Whereas, you know, uh, in St. Louis de Montfort's day, I don't know, maybe they didn't wear, but he certainly wore, they said you could hear him coming down the hall, you know, he had, I always say that, but, you know, literally that's what Father Gaffney said. You could hear him. He couldn't sneak around because he had chains around his ankles, his waist, his wrists. He wore a huge crucifix. I mean, he just... You know, and, and we skipped the paragraph earlier uh, in the year, but their Blessed Mother Agnes put a chain around her waist for her entire life and was immediately set free of her fears and worries when she did this. But um, anyway, we're not going to read all of this, but we're supposed to try to look at it not as merely jewelry, you know, really try to um, you know, get it blessed, whatever it is, if you want to do this. Um, so I'm going to skip a few paragraphs here. Um, where he just gives re his reasons for this. He, he quotes St. Paul as being in cha chains for Christ, you know, before he died. Um, he talks about when we die, our chains will still be on us. And so it's kind of beautiful what he says. But anyway, go to 238. So really, I'm just skipping one paragraph. Um, it says, the following are the reasons for wearing these little chains. First, to remind the Christian of the vows and promises of his baptism, of the perfect renewal he has made of them, by this devotion of the strict obligation under which he is to be faithful to them. As man who shapes his course more often by the senses than by pure faith, he easily forgets his obligations toward God unless he has some outward thing to remind them of him, of them, which we've said. These little chains serve marvelously to remind the Christians of the chains of sin and slavery of the devil from which the baptism has delivered him and of the dependence on Jesus which he has vowed to him in baptism. All of the and of the ratification of it, which he has made by the renewal of his vows. One of the reasons why so few Christians think of their baptismal vows and live with as much license as if they had promised no more to God than the heathen is that they do not wear any external sign to remind them of their vows. Okay, so again, in his day, you know, in our day, it's fashionable, and everybody wears a cross, even singers and rap singers and I mean it's just kind of like fashionable to wear a cross you know so it may or may not reflect it probably does I mean obviously you're not going to wear a cross if you don't love the Lord but um anyway I like what his his next one is I think really even even better he says secondly in 239 he says to show we are not ashamed of the cross is another reason to wear it and if we've been ashamed in the past you know we need to repent of that you know, if we've ever been ashamed of the name of Jesus or whatever it is, we want to just tell the Lord we're sorry for that. Um, he says, we're not ashamed of the slavery of Jesus Christ, and we renounce the slavery of the world, the sin, and the devil. And then finally, and I think this is maybe the most important one, why I wear um, my scapular, my miraculous medal, and everything, it says to protect ourselves against the chains of sin and the devil. For we must either wear the chains of sinners or the chains of the charity and salvation. You know, the devil hates anything blessed, you know, that's real. And so I, I believe that. And that's part of the reason too. But it is to edify our neighbor as well. You know, I don't just wear this to edify my neighbor. But I've had so many people tell me, oh, it's so beautiful, you know, in the stores or whatever. And so we don't know that, that what that does in their heart and their soul. What that might just be the spark needed to get someone back to church. You know, we don't know. So it is a powerful witness to have symbols on us, you know, to show that we're, especially Catholic, I think, you know, if you have anything Mary on you, it's going to rightly show that you're Catholic. Um, and then even, and I don't want to make anyone feel bad by saying this, and no one has to go out and buy new jewelry or anything, but the cross, the crucifix is specifically Catholic, you know, and, and I've had people say, oh, but I love my cross. Well, that's great, you know, um, but it's just something to think about. If, if you Specifically, well, if you have your cross with a Mary medal, there's no question, you know, right there that you're Catholic or whatever. But um, so I'm just throwing that out that we're the only Christian religion that has the body of Christ on our crosses because we still, it's still important to meditate on the passion of Jesus, not once and done and behind us. Okay, um, so I'm not going to read 240. Because he, he talks more in 241 and 242. Okay, so all of those, he just, he really, even though he says it's not necessary and you don't have to do it, and then he, he feels strongly about it. But that was a different age, and you can do what you want on that. Okay, so, but what's more important here is this next part 
next practice, I guess, which is the special devotion to the mystery of the incarnation. Now, there is just not enough time to even talk about how important this is. And every year on the Feast of the, and this year it was moved after, because it was during Holy Week this year, and so it was April 8th or something, it was after like Divine Mercy Sunday that they even celebrated it. But every year I think, oh, I need to send an email, and remind everybody how important this is and do a novena and make sure you go to mass that day. And just, But it is the central feast of this devotion. Now, many people make their consecration on that feast day. Um, many people change their consecration day to this day, which is fine too. You can, you know, do whatever you want. But um, anyway, just the, the importance of the incarnation and why. Why is it? And the reason is, is when Jesus takes flesh in the womb of Mary, it, that is where all Marian devotion begins, obviously. You know, she gets, it's, and I love it, it's the feast of Jesus and Mary. I mean, it's obviously the feast of our Lord coming down, taking on flesh, but it was dependent on her, yes. So her fiat, we're celebrating her fiat that day as well, okay? And that's why I love that it's the feast of Jesus and Mary. Um, but that, but she's the, that's the first time we see a living tabernacle. You know, so already the incarnation is pointing to the Eucharist because Jesus is dwelling in her womb. It's the first time we see Jesus dependent on his mother. It's the first time we see the union, the intimate union of Jesus and Mary. Um, it's the first time that we have to go through Mary to get to Jesus because he's in her womb. So when we say to Jesus through Mary, we literally mean it in this um, devotion or this um, mystery of the incarnation. And then as we've said, it... it the law of the incarnation is really defines the Christian life. To have Jesus fully formed in us, we need the operation of Mary and the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about that. So you can see why this mystery is, should become really important to you. And we need to spend time in prayer meditating on it. And so St. Lance de Montfort gives us a little bit of his own meditation on it. Um, and I wish he gave us more. But this is what he says. In two, and I'll read you a little bit. We're going to go a little bit over today. But um, I'll read you a little bit of what Father... Hugh Gillespie says, it's in the Scray book. Okay, it says, those who undertake this holy slavery should have a special devotion to the great mystery of the incarnation of the word. Indeed, the incarnation is the mystery proper of this practice, inasmuch as it is a devotion inspired by the Holy Ghost. And so he gives two reasons why it should be important. First, to honor and imitate an imitation is the big word there, to imitate the ineffable dependence which the Son of God was pleased to have on Mary for his Father's glory and for our salvation. And number two, oh, I'm sorry, it says, which dependence particularly appears in this mystery, wherein Jesus is a captive and a slave in the bosom of the divine Mary, small d, and depends on her for all things. Secondly, to thank God for the incomparable graces he has given Mary, and particularly for having chosen her to be his most holy mother, which choice was made in this mystery. These are the two principal ends of the slavery of Jesus in Mary. So he starts calling, we, we saw earlier, we calls her, we calls this devotion Jesus in Mary. And again, he has a, a handbook called Jesus Living in Mary, you know, the focus on the incarnation. Um, and what's so beautiful, and I, it just each year I feel like I learn more and more, um, is the second question, the third question, which we're not going to answer yet because we haven't read it yet. So, but anyway, why is the incarnation considered to be like the summary of everything else? You know, why is that? And it's because it was... Um, and I'll answer it when we get to the third question, but, but it's Mar Mary's fiat, and I know we've talked about this already, but it wasn't a yes to conceiving Jesus. It wasn't just a yes to becoming the mother of God, but it was a yes for all eternity for whatever was going to come. And I think we talked about that Father Gaffney had said that it's like on your wedding day when you say, I do. It's just good and bad and sickness and health. It's a all encompassing. And that's why this mystery is so important because Jesus too, by you know, leaving the Godhead and becoming, taking on flesh is doing that in complete submission to and surrender of the father and in, in humility of um, being a slave or being captive in the womb of Mary as, as St. Louis de Montfort words it here. Um, so it's so important. Now I'm, we're going to skip 244 because he talks about the wording of Jesus in Mary and the slavery of Jesus in Mary. It's better to say that than just Mary, so as not to confuse that Mary is not our last end, but you know, so anyway, he goes on and on in the next two paragraphs about that, 
Um, so go down to 246. Okay, and this is why he says the incarnation is so important. He says, a second reason is that the principal mystery we celebrate and honor in this devotion is the mystery in the incarnation, whereas we can see Jesus only in Mary and incarnate in her bosom. Hence, it is more to the purpose to speak of the slavery of Jesus in Mary and of, resi of Jesus residing and reigning in Mary, according to that beautiful prayer of so many great men. O oh, Jesus, living in Mary, come and live in us in the spirit of sanctity. And that's a prayer that is really treasured by the Montfort Fathers, because Father Hugh has you say it every day, and the little, if you've got the gray book. Um, 247. Another reason is that this manner of speaking sets forth still more of the intimate union between Jesus and Mary. They are so intimately united that the one is altogether in the other. Jesus is altogether in Mary, and Mary is altogether in Jesus, or rather, she exists no more, but Jesus alone is in her. And it were easier to separate the light from the sun than Mary from Jesus, so that we might call our Lord Jesus of Mary and our Blessed Lady, Mary of Jesus. So it's just so, it's such a deep, beautiful mystery and that we're not to separate them after Jesus' birth, you know, which so many people try to do. And just, she was sort of just like a, you know, whatever, a carrier of him and, that, and then set her aside. That's not, that was never the plan of God. You know, she was with him all the way up to the foot of the cross and, and still um, reigning at his side today. Okay, and then he says here in 248, <clears throat> time would not permit me, which I wish it could, <laughs> to stop now to explain the excellences and the grandeurs of the mystery of Jesus living and reigning in Mary, in other words, of the incarnation of the word. I will content myself with saying these few words. We have here the first mystery of Jesus Christ, the most hidden, the most exalted, and the least known. It is in this mystery that Jesus, in his mother's womb, which is for that very reason called by the saints the cabinet of the secrets of God, has in concert with Mary chosen all the elect. It is in this mystery that he has wrought all other mysteries of his life by the acceptance which he made of them. When he cometh into the world, he said, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. Hence this mystery is an abridgment of all mysteries and contains the will and the grace of all. Finally, this mystery is the throne of mercy, of the liberality and of the glory of God. It is the throne of mercy for us because as we cannot approach Jesus but through Mary, we can see Jesus and speak to him only by means of her. Jesus, who always hears his dear mother, always grants his grace and mercy to poor sinners. Let us go therefore with confidence to the throne of grace. It is the throne of his liberality toward Mary because while the new Adam dwelt in that true terrestrial paradise, he worked so many miracles in secret that neither the angels nor men can comprehend them. It is on this account that the saints call Mary the magnificence of God, as if God were magnificent only in Mary. It is the throne of his glory for the Father because it is in Mary that Jesus Christ has calmed his Father angered against men, and that he has made restitution of the glory which sin ravished from him, and that by the sacrifice he made of his own will and of himself, he has given him more glory than ever, than ever the sacrifices of the old law could give, an infinite glory which he had never before received from man. So that gets more powerful every time I read that. And he's calling Mary's womb a throne. And it's a throne, that's why in this life we can imagine ourselves in the throne room, you know, in her womb. Um, but he says here a couple things that just might sound kind of funny. He says, um, he has in concert with Mary chosen all the elect. So that might sound weird, but well, Father, um, I'm not sure where I read this either. He says, chosen for the elect means that salvation has begun for those who choose to follow Christ. That's what that sentence means. The elect meaning another word for predestinate or those that will choose, that will choose Christ, that will die in the state of grace. Okay. Um, and then again, I just think this is such a beautiful paragraph. It kind of grows on you. I mean, I used to think it was really long and I didn't really get it. You know, I, mean, I thought it was beautiful, but each year I read it, it's just, oh, I just, and that's why St. Louis de Montfort says, you know, spend time. The Holy Spirit will reveal things to you. He'll reveal things to you about the incarnation that maybe you've never, you know, it just takes putting that time in and, and at mass on that day or praying a novena for that feast day and more will be revealed. But let's look at the third question. 
because he says also something very interesting. He says, um, okay, it's a long question. <laughs> um, all right, I'll go ahead and read it because I do love this first paragraph here. He says, the incarnation is a central mystery of our faith. Father Gaffney says, all the mysteries of the redemption are contained in the compendium of salvation history. And this compendium, compendium means a brief summary of a very complex subject. I had to look that up. The more we ponder this great mystery, the more we come to understand how important Mary's role is in the salvation of the world. St. Thomas Aquinas says, Mary consents to the incarnation in the place of the entire human nature so that there would be a certain spiritual matrimony between the Son of God and human nature. The incarnation is the marriage of God and mankind, the bride and the bridegroom right, in its perfection. The Feast of the Annunciation on March 25th should become a very special day for you. Not only do we focus on Mary's humility, her submissiveness to God's will and her unique role in the salvation of souls. But through this devotion, we also come to understand the great dependence that Jesus had on his blessed mother throughout his entire life, beginning at the moment of his conception. Furthermore, when we contemplate the excellence and grandeurs of this mystery of Jesus living in Mary, we gain an insight into the indissoluble union of Christ and his mother. But what does St. Louis de Montfort mean when he states that the mystery of the Incarnation is an abridgment of all the mysteries and contains the will and the grace of all? Well, I just answered that a few minutes ago. It's the I do, meaning it's forever. Um, but it's an ultimate, one of the reasons, too, why it's an abridgment and why it encompasses everything that's going to happen is it's the ultimate act of humility for God to become man. And it's the ultimate act of humility on Mary's part as well, where she says, I am the handmaid of the Lord, which means I am the slave of the Lord. You know, be it done to me, this thing that is, uh, has never been done before, you know, a virgin conceiving, you know, there's no possible way she can understand it. But she has sacrificed her intellect, like we just read, Father Basil Cole said, faith is a sacrifice of the intellect. It's knowing that we're not going to understand it. Well, the Blessed Mother had no problem sacrificing her intellect. And so that's why this is such a great, um, why this encompasses everything else about her. Because everything else, this is just the beginning of what her entire life is going to be. It's a saying yes, right, to things she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand everything. But um, what I love is he says that, she, that Jesus worked so many miracles in her womb that neither the angels nor men can comprehend them. I mean, it's such a beautiful thought of the, the intimacy of mother and son during those nine months and what he revealed to her, you know, and it prepared her to be our mother because that's why, I mean, she was his mother, but he was preparing her to be our mother. You know, that very last thing before you die, you know, is the most important thing you want to say to your family, you know, was here's your mother, you know, at the foot of the cross when Jesus was dying. He could have given his mother and said, to his disciples earlier when he was living with them, that Mary's going to be your mother now, you know, after I die. But, you know, he waited because he wanted to have the emphasis of how important that was, that I have prepared her for you to be your mother. Okay, so then, um, again, her yes and his humility encompassed everything. Um, and I already mentioned she's the first tabernacle of the living Christ, so it points to the Eucharist. Um, so let's go on, because I want to talk about, and I know we're almost out of time here, but I really want to get to this next part here. We'll end with this um, next one, which is the devotion to the Hail Mary and the Rosary. You'll see, if we, if we just skip ahead a few pages, I, you'll see that he also says devotion to the Magnificat. We're not going to get to that. And then he says contempt and flight from the world, which is what we're going to start doing with our 33 days. We're going to start focusing more on that. So these are just some of the exterior practices that he gives. So devotion to the Magnificat, and a lot of times people pray that right after communion to magnify the Lord with Mary. Um, and if, when you on your own read that paragraph, he says, again, with so many uh, things that we're reading here, that the Holy Spirit will reveal more to you. If you devote yourself to the rosary, if you devote yourself to the um, Magnificat or to the little crown, all these things, the Holy Spirit, the incarnation, Holy Spirit is going to reveal more and more to you, okay? But um, let's end with looking at this. It says, 249, devotion to the Hail Mary, which, again, this is another one of those parts of the book that each year I read it, it means more and more to me. 
It says, those who adopt this slavery ought to have a great devotion to saying the Hail Mary, the angelical salutation. Few Christians, and notice he says Christians. He doesn't say Catholics. Because the Hail Mary is scriptural. It's in the Bible, at least two-thirds of it, right? And so, he, but again, this was written at a time, so it gets a little harsh here. And so we have to know that he doesn't mean this per se in our day, what he says. But anyway, it says, few Christians, however enlightened, know the real value, merit, excellence, and necessity of the Hail Mary. It was necessary for the Blessed Virgin to appear several times to great and enlightened saints to show them the merit of it. She did so to St. Dominic, St. John Capistran, and the Blessed Alan de la Roche. They have composed entire works on the wonders and the efficacy of that prayer for converting souls. They have loudly proclaimed and openly preached that salvation having begun with the Hail Mary. The salvation of each one of us in particular is attached to that prayer. They tell us that it is the prayer which made the dry and barren earth bring forth the fruit of life, and that it is that prayer well said which makes the word of God germinate in our souls and bring forth Jesus Christ, the fruit of life. They tell us that the Hail Mary is the heavenly dew for watering the earth, which is the soul, to make it bring forth its fruit in season, and that a soul which is not watered by that prayer bears no fruit and brings forth only thorns and brambles and is ready to be cursed. Well, okay, a little harsh there. And again, written at a time of well-catechized Catholics and you know, even Father Gaffney says that, you know, in his day, not so much in our day, because people haven't been taught, right? But in his day, he says, um, well, where is it? I'll just get his words, because. Okay, he says, how can a Christian show lukewarmness, or even worse, distaste, for the central mystery of the faith, if you're a Christian? You know, if you're a Christian. He says that St. Louis de Montfort refers to Christians who know and accept that the first part of the Hail Mary is nothing less than the beginning of redemption. He says that for such people to experience revulsion at the words of God's infinite love for us is almost impossible to imagine. It would indicate a culpable turning away from the faith. Okay, so again, we have to read this in light of our age and what's been taught and what's not been taught. But other than that last sentence there, it's such a beautiful paragraph to say the Hail Mary well. And I just encourage you all to really, really start slowing down and meditating on the Hail Mary and making that. And, and it just is kind of hitting me. Like, we love all these other prayers, and there are so many beautiful prayers. But the Our Father was composed by Jesus. I mean, what really greater prayer could there be? And so we shouldn't be searching for all these other prayers all the time. That we should be, you know, during Mass, trying to force ourselves to meditate on each word of the Our Father and the Hail Mary being the second greatest prayer because it's from the, gar the angel Gabriel and Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth. It's scriptural. And so outside of these two prayers, you know, there are no greater prayers. And that we have to realize this and really think about this. And so not only that, but to realize the power of one Hail Mary well said and what that does for our souls and how much Mary loves it. And so for more on this, read St. Louis de Montfort's Secret of the Rosary because he goes through line by line of the Hail Mary and the Our Father and, I, and you, it will help you to meditate more. But it's like, I mean, I'm kind of dense, so I'm finally just this year really doing this more than I have in the past. But I am praying, help me to understand the power of one Hail Mary well said because I do believe that it is very powerful if we believe it, but we have to believe it ourselves. And as I mentioned, um, and I'm not sure if I told you in this group, but I have a friend in the other group who, he's a cop, and he told me I could tell the story. But, and stop me if I already told it. But he said he had a guy who was a fallen away Catholic, and this guy would just slam the faith and make fun of the priest. And, he, and, my, and this guy, my friend, said that he would almost get in fistfights with him every day because it was just drove him nuts you know and so he said finally one day he asked the guy in front of a bunch of other guys he's like you don't, if you think this is all fake I dare you to pray the Hail Mary one Hail Mary a day for a month and see what happens 
He's like, and you can say, all right, I don't believe this, but I'm just going to do it. And, and this guy now is so devout. He ended up finding, and he ended up getting, breaking up with his girlfriend and met another girl. And this is all over a period of several years. That changed his life. Um, and he's, my friend said he accepted the challenge because there are all these guys, he couldn't say no. So he's like, okay, you know, I'll do it. So he did it, and then he actually said that he did it again because the first time he did it to prove that he could do it. But then something changed in him, and he wanted to do it again. So he did another 30 days for himself, you know, because he felt some stirrings going on. Well, anyway, he ended up marrying in the church this girl. They named their first daughter Grace Maria, and he has now joined this group and no, I can't think of the name of the Society of St. John. And his goal is to, to teach all men the beauty of the faith. This is this guy's goal now. And so he, I mean, what a witness story, you know. So, but my friend believed it. And he had the courage to say that. And so we need to challenge people, you know. And just kind of don't have to put any pressure on. Just say, just try it. And, you know, and I did this with the, that man when I got my phone at the mall. And I don't have it. They never know, but um, you know, he said he would do it, and I think we'll find that maybe people would be more willing, even a Protestant might not get them to be able to say a Hail Mary, but you never know. The fallen away Catholics, for sure, our fallen away Catholic family members, you know, let's let's give them the Hail Mary challenge, and then you be praying it with them, of course, uh, while they're doing it. So it's just pray for an increase of faith in the Hail Mary, um, and then of course the Rosary. So let's go on. And this was before the Rosary. You know, St. Louis de Montfort was, wrote this book before the Rosary. I'm sorry, before Fatima, I mean. Before Fatima, before the Blessed Mother came and told us to pray it every day. And he already knew back then. And I always have to say this because I still pray for Father Crappy. But he used to say, if there's one piece of advice that I can give you, it would be to pray the Rosary every day. You know, which is why I know he'll be back because <laughs> I just know. Um, Anyway, so let's read, because he talks about the rosary. Um, he's really focusing on the Hail Mary, but you can apply what he's saying here to the rosary, which he gets to here at the end. Okay, so 250, he says, and this again is a kind of harshly worded, but it, Mary appeared in the 1400s and said this, in the 1400s of that time to those people, you know, the well-catechized Catholics of that time. It says, listen to what Our Lady revealed to Blessed Alan de la Roche as he is recorded in the book on the dignity of the rosary. So the Blessed Mother says, Know my son and make all others know that it is a probable and proximate sign of eternal damnation to have an aversion, a lukewarmness, or a negligence in saying the angelical salutation, which is the Hail Mary, which has repaired the whole world. These words are at once terrible and consoling, and we should find it hard to believe them if, if we had not if we had not that holy man for a guarantee and St. Dominic before him and many great men since. But we also have the experience of several ages, for it has always been remarked that those who wear the outward sign of reprobation, like all impious heretics and proudly, proud worldlings, hate or despise the Hail Mary and the Rosary. Heretics, now these are Catholics he's talking about here. Heretics still learn and say they are Father, but not the Hail Mary nor the Rosary. They abhor it. They would rather wear a serpent than a Rosary. The proud also, again, see here, although Catholic, have the same inclinations as their father Lucifer, and so have only contempt or indifference for the Hail Mary. And look at the rosary as a devotion, which is good only for the ignorant and those who cannot read. On the contrary, it is an equally universal experience that those who have otherwise great marks of predestination about them love and relish the Hail Mary and delight in saying it. We always see that the more a man is for God, the more he likes that prayer. This is why Our Lady also said to Blessed Alan afterward, after the words which I have just quoted. Okay, so again, don't take this to be, oh my gosh, you know, uh, about people who don't pray the Hail Mary or don't pray the Rosary or if you don't pray it yourself. I mean, that's not, this is a time where this is what they did, you know. This is, it would be like, um, I don't even know what to, to compare it to. Well, missing Mass, maybe because we know we're supposed to do that, although many people don't. And many Catholics haven't even been taught how that, well, that's a grave sin to miss. But um, so again, we, we look at this through in our modern day. And so when, when the Blessed Mother appeared, I guess what we could apply to us, to those of us, you know, when she says a lukewarmness or an indifferent, you know, or, or a negligence, it's not an occasional, oh, I missed praying today or I missed the rosary. If, if, the, if you pray the rosary every day, you know, often because I miss it. From time to time. Um, so it's not that. You know, it's really what I read you what Father Gaffney wrote. 
It's really an aversion that there's something about Mary and you're Catholic, okay? Not those who have not been taught or raised or Protestant, but if you, you know, you, you hate the Hail Mary, you hate the rosary, you know, or if there, there's a pride there that the rosary is for the ignorant, you know, the people who are not smart enough to study all these things, so they just pray the rosary, that kind of, you know, which is still, sometimes you hear that in certain universities or so-called Catholic places. You know, I went to a Catholic, I won't even name it, so-called Catholic for mass one time, um, and the priest, it was this all school mass, and the priest got up and during his homily was talking about um, pre-Vatican II stuff that we don't do anymore, like the rosary. So it is still the thinking of many people today, you know, that that is an ancient thing that we, we're beyond. You know, we don't need that. We're, too, we're smart enough now that we can do other things, okay? So it's just, you know, take this paragraph and apply it to what you already know. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying something really scary or harsh here about us or our family members. But what we need to do is ourselves come to love it. You know, ask Mary for the grace to really love the Hail Mary and the Rosary, and then we can be witnesses to others. You know, in our age, that's what we have to pray for, that we can be a witness of the joy that it gives us and the beauty of the prayer. And, you know, and it's scriptural, that kind of stuff, just talking points that we can bring to people's minds and hearts. Um, okay, here, Father... Um, Father B, oh, Father Basil, I'm <laughs> like, Father B, is that Father, <laughs> which one is that? Okay, <clears throat> Father Basil Cole said, in my, when he reviewed, he said, people, I guess today, don't like the rosary because they do not understand that it's both a vocal prayer and a contemplative prayer. So it's not just a bunch of Hail Mary string together and you just gotta get through them. But a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand that it's actually, that it's, that's the background music, you know. That the meditation is, is the meditating on the life of Christ. And there are many Protestants who pray the rosary, who have come to pray the rosary because they understand that it's a meditation on scripture, because that's what it is. Um, and Father Basil said that in Ireland, in the last century, it says the rosary was shoved down the throats of young people, such that they don't pray it anymore, because it wasn't explained. You know, it was just you have to pray the rosary, you have to pray the rosary. And so, obviously, we want to educate ourselves, and that's why Pope John Paul II wrote his encyclical on the rosary to help us understand that it's much more than just a bunch of prayers. Okay, it's actually contemplation at the school of Mary, he calls it, on the life of Christ. Okay. Well, I'm sorry we're going over, but I want to get to that last question so that we... Um, okay, we'll skip 51. Basically, he says, people who like the rosary, who really love it, that's one way to show that, you know, probably in a state of grace, although, you know, not for sure. But anyway, he just says that the Holy Spirit, being the spouse of Mary, is going to lead you to love the rosary if you're in the state of grace, or love the Hail Mary if you're in the state of grace and you're Catholic. Okay, so then he, here at 250, we'll just read these last um, couple paragraphs here, 252. So he's begging us now. He's really pleading with us. He says, O predestinate souls, slaves of Jesus and Mary, learn that the Hail Mary is the most beautiful of all prayers after the Our Father. It is the most perfect compliment which you can give to Mary because it is the compliment which the Most High sent her by an archangel in order to win her heart. And it is so powerful over her, her heart by the secret charms of which it is so full that in spite of her profound humility, she gave her consent to the incarnation of the Word. It is by this compliment also that you will infallibly win her heart if you say it as you ought. So just beautiful ways of thinking of the Hail Mary. And, and actually, what I didn't say earlier, I meant to say, was that your devotion to the Incarnation will naturally lead you to your devotion to the Hail Mary. Because when you meditate on the Incarnation, the Archangel appearing with those words, Hail Mary, full of grace, it's going to lead you to have a greater love for the Hail Mary itself. And you know, when you think about the Hail Mary, and when I send the prayer requests, you know, that's what I try to do. And I'll, sometimes I'll just get a bunch of them all together or whatever. But then I'll try to say one Hail Mary really slowly. You know, what, it's what, 10, 15 seconds? You know, isn't that amazing how much we, we're, we don't even want to give 10 or 15 seconds? Or we'll say it distractedly? You know, so just put your pen down or wherever you are. 
close your eyes and say that one. Because can you imagine the power? If we start saying our Hail Marys well for these people, all these prayer requests that we're getting, if we start really meditating on the words, you know, Hail Mary, full of grace, and I mean, that just brings to mind, you know, the grace full of the divine life, full of Jesus, you know, the, the Lord is with thee. Right there, you're, you're saying that the union of Jesus and Mary, they're always together, you know, and just to pray that, blessed art thou, my woman, and to pray it slowly and meditate, if we can start doing that, and we're going to see so many more miracles of healings, I just know it. I mean, that's just what I feel more each year I read this book. Okay, and then this is the answer to the last question. This is the next paragraph, which is, we'll end with this. Um, the fourth question then, let me read the question first, I guess. Okay. Um, it's, oh gosh, it's long. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read it just because I have a quote in here from the... Um, that's it. Do we really understand the beauty and the power of the Holy Rosary? Okay, so here, in his book, The Secret of the Rosary, St. Louis de Montfort says, How could there be any prayers, Our Father and Hail Mary, more pleasant to God and to the Blessed Virgin, or any that are easier, more precious, and more helpful than these two prayers? We should always have them in our hearts and on our lips in honor of the most blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ our Savior, and the, his most holy Mother. And then we've said this already, but he states sometimes when we pray the rosary, we should simply meditate on the words and meaning of the Our Father and the Hail Mary. And St. Louis de Montfort says, few Christians, however enlightened, know the real value, merit, excellence, and necessity of the Hail Mary. He quotes other Marian saints as saying that since our salvation began with the Hail Mary, then the salvation of each one of us is, in particular is attached to that prayer. No wonder it is necessary to have at least some amount of devotion to the Blessed Virgin, as we talked about earlier in the year, if you're Catholic. Okay. According to St. Louis de Montfort, then, what is the proper, and I think this is a really important question for us, what is the proper way to pray the Hail Mary, and you could say the Rosary, in order to reap all the blessings that God has desires to give us through this beautiful prayer? Because if we just rip through it and don't think about it, yeah, that's good, but we're not reaping all the blessings that God desires to give us through this prayer. So he answers it here in 253. He says, the Hail Mary well said, that is, without attention, I'm sorry, with, with, the, with attention, devotion, and modesty. So that's the answer, and I'm going to look at all those in more detail in just a second. Okay, he says, that is, according to the saints, the enemy of the devil, which puts him to flight, and, ham and the hammer which crushes him. It is the sanctification of the soul. This is so beautiful. It is the joy of the angels, the melody of the predestinate, the canticle of the New Testament, the pleasure of Mary, and the glory of the Most Holy Trinity. The Hail Mary is the heavenly dew which fertilizes the soul. It is the chaste and loving kiss which we give to Mary. It is a vermilion rose which we present to her, a precious pearl we offer her, a chalice of divine ambrosial nectar which we proffer to her. All these are comparisons of the saints. This is so beautiful. Um, but let's look at these three things really quickly. So. So with attention, obviously, that means to meditate, think about what we're saying, make an effort, fight the distractions. Okay, that's the first part. With devotion, it means with love in our heart and thanksgiving. So it's not just a thinking, it's a feeling, too. It's both. We want to think, but we want to have love and thanksgiving in our heart. But I think the most important one is with modesty. Modesty is an internal virtue. You know, we often think of modesty as modest dress, and it is external. It expresses itself externally as well. Um, but modesty is an internal virtue that means simple and childlike. And I think this is where we can get the most out of our prayers, and praying our rosaries especially, is if we have this attitude. It says, modest to pray the rosary, or just your one Hail Mary, with modesty means to pray it with humility, confidence, openness, and expectation. Little children expect that their parents are going to do things for them. They don't doubt, right? It's just part of them. They just know. And so I just think that's so important. I wanted to point that out. But that's the virtue of modesty is to be, you know, just like a little kid when you're praying the rosary and to expect that you're going to receive blessings. And when you start praying this, when you leave here today and you start praying your Hail Mary well and slowly, Pray it with trust and expectation. And the Lord is going to bless you then more. The Lord wants us to trust. Jesus says, 
in his diary to St. Faustina, the more you trust in me, the more mercy I will pour out on you and on souls. So it's dependent on, but we, are, we know that we can't just go to the store and buy trust, right? It's a gift. So we want to pray for it. Lord, increase my trust. Increase my confidence. Increase my expectation. Just like it was a gift that I said the other day, Mother, I want those books to arrive. I really was not that surprised when I saw that they had arrived. I mean, it was a miracle and I appreciate it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know that it was going to happen, but I wasn't totally surprised because I've been praying for more trust. I've been praying for more confidence in my prayers. You know, St. Paul tells us that, to pray as if you had already received. And we need to start doing that, but we can't get that on our own. We can try as hard as we want, but that's a gift. And we have to ask for it. So daily ask for it. It comes back to more faith. Faith is just like, encompasses all this, right? I mean, that's what more faith is. And it's a year of faith. So <laughs> it's just such a blessing right now. And I really feel like Jesus just wants to, and maybe I said this last time, but I think I did, but I'll say it again because it's just been such a beautiful image. But on the divine mercy, you know, when Jesus, pour, he says to meditate on, or that priest said to pray that prayer, O oh, blood and water which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus. So, well, I imagine a waterfall. Did I say this last time? I always imagine now, not always, but I'll be praying for God to pour out his faith, especially in this year of faith, and I'll just in my mind see this waterfall, and then I just start sticking people under it, you know? Because <laughs> Jesus, because that's what the prayer is. That's what, you know, he says in the diary that if you say this prayer, a blood and water which gushed forth, it's not a trickle, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy, I trust in you, I will convert sinners. He says that in his diary. So that's what we need to do. We need to be praying that prayer multiple times and then putting them under the blood and water and let, you know, Jesus is going to have work his miracles. Okay, um, and then 254 here, we'll end with this last paragraph. He says, I pray you urgently. It's urgent. We don't, there, there's no time to waste now, especially now, as we all know. I pray you urgently by the love I bear for you in Jesus and Mary, not to content yourself with praying the little crown of the Blessed Virgin, but to say five decades or even, if you have time, 15 or 20 for us, of the rosary every day. Okay, again, this is before Fatima. At the moment of your death, you will bless the, the day and the hour in which you followed my advice. Having thus sown in the blessings of Jesus Mary, you will reap eternal blessings in heaven. He who soweth in blessings shall also reap blessings. So again, Google those 15 promises of the Blessed Virgin. I just read them yesterday because someone Googled them for me and sent them to me so that I can send them to you, which I'll do. Anyway, I read them again. It was just like, oh my gosh. I mean, to pray the rosary faithfully with attention, devotion and modesty, okay? With those, with those three, if we just try to do that. I mean, the promises are so unbelievable. You won't die without the sacraments of the church. I mean, what greater thing? Could there be? You will not have a sudden death without the sacraments. That's an amazing promise that the Blessed Mother made for those who faithfully pray the rosary every day. That's one of the 15. So read those, read them to your family. Okay, and we'll end there. And we'll, I'll see you in two weeks. And by then, we'll be well into our 33 days. If you have any you know, questions along the way, you can feel free to ask me or someone that you know who's been doing it for a few years. And... Um, I guess when we see each other again, we'll be in that week of knowledge of self. So pray that litany of humility and uh, just do the best you can. All I can say is do the best you can without getting overwhelmed. Okay? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you all thanksgiving, praise, honor, and glory just for your love, for your blessings, for another day of life. We thank you for the Blessed Mother, and we thank you for this opportunity that you're giving us right now to make this little retreat of 33 days to prepare our souls and our hearts and our minds to give ourselves entirely to you through the hands of the Blessed Mother and what a gift this is and just how blessed we are to, to be learning it and to be receiving it. We ask you for the courage and the confidence and the perseverance to get through these 33 days and knowing that it won't be easy but that you'll be there with us to help us and that Mary, of course, will be sheltering us from all the things that are going to be thrown at us. And we just bring to you also all of our prayer intentions, all of our loved ones, the sick, the suffering, the dying, those who have asked us to pray, those who we forget to pray for, we put them all in Mary's heart. And Jesus, we pray in your holy name. 
the memory. Remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee I come before thee I stand, simple and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Sorry, it's so late. <laughs>